Hello and welcome to episode 6 of my Hearts of Iron 3 basic tutorial series. Today we will check out politics. First let's summarize our options on this screen. We have our government type and a list of all current ministers, an overview of the current political situation in our country, our laws, a list of countries we currently occupy and their respective occupation policies, strategic warfare impact on national unity and then we have the options to mobilize, liberate a country and create a puppet. Let's start with ministers. Every country has these positions in the government where you can assign ministers. Each minister has a trait that can influence a variety of things in your country related to their position. Whenever there is a position for which you have other candidates you can click the replace button to see them. The options here change over time as many ministers have a specific date at which they become available, so check back here occasionally to see if you have new ministers to pick. A trade effect you'll see a lot here is decay reduction. There is one thing I haven't told you about practical and theory knowledge yet, and that is that they slowly decrease over time if you're not increasing them. It's already a pretty slow pace even without these traits, so it's not as good as many other traits. For example, for our chief of the army here, someone with supply consumption reduction is a better choice. Of course you won't always have better ministers available. You can change the ministers whenever you like, but there is something other than their traits to consider, and that is their political orientation. Each minister is part of a political party in your country, as indicated by the color of the circle next to his portrait. Hovering over the popularity pie chart on the right, shows you how many seats in the cabinet each party wants. The more popular the party, the more seats they want. Ideally, you'll have one party massively in the lead that claims all cabinet seats. With some countries, you'll start in that ideal situation. With other countries like Republic and Spain in 1936 here, we start with a much more contested political landscape. This brings with it the issue of a fractured government. A fractured government puts a slight penalty on your national unity. To avoid that, you should try to give each political party exactly as many seats as it requests. Note that the head of the state and head of government are not part of the cabinet and not subject to cabinet seat requests. With several parties requesting seats though, it is often impossible to make everybody happy as you may not have enough ministers of each party available and if you do, they might not have the traits you want to use. So usually, the best course of action is to just support your ruling party with spies and minister traits so it gains support until there is just one party in full control and just ignore the fractured government until then. Thankfully, the national unity penalty from a fractured government is very small so you can live with it for quite a while. Still, national unity is also hard to increase and low national unity can reduce your options in terms of laws you can enact. So over here we have each party's organization, which defines how popular it can be. Popularity is what really matters and while the best organized party will usually also be the most popular one, if you have dissent, the ruling party will be blamed and its popularity will drop. Despite all these graphics you have little direct control over politics and it's something you won't have to deal with most of the time. Do pay attention to what ministers you assign to avoid the fractured government, if possible, and try to support your ruling party to put it fully in control. That's pretty much it for politics. Let's now move on to laws. There are seven different types of laws, and each of them has three to five options. The bottom laws are often the most desirable, but which ones you can select usually depends on how close you are to being at war, as well as some other factors. Some of them require you to actually be at war before you can enact them. Let's take a look at our conscription laws for example. Conscription affects manpower, officer recruitment and reserves penalty. Just to clarify, manpower rotation defines how much manpower our forces lose in peacetime due to ending the required service. Reserves penalty defines how expensive it is to maintain reserve units during peacetime. Volunteer army we currently use reduces manpower generation, increases manpower rotation and we get a reduced reserves penalty. Service by requirement on the other hand 
basically turns all that around and drastically increases manpower and officer recruitment, but makes reserves more expensive to maintain, which is not an issue if you're at war and have your reserves mobilized. You can hover over the checkmark buttons to see the conditions for enacting the law. For service by requirement, we need to be at war, so that's pretty simple. Other laws might have less drastic requirements or several different ways to get them to unlock depending on your government type. In our case though, we couldn't enact any of these right now because they all need at least 60 unity and we're down at 49, which severely limits us. If you play as Germany for example, you start with a unified government and 90 national unity, which makes laws much easier to control. Let's look through the other available laws. Civil laws improve counterintelligence, which makes it harder for enemy spies to gather information on your country. It also improves ruling party support and lessens the consumer goods your population requires, so it frees up some industrial capacity. Partisan efficiency, which is the only downside for more severe laws here, increases the revolt risk in occupied countries. Plus 4 partisan efficiency is noticeable, but it's worth it. One law category where you can choose whatever you feel is best at any time are the training laws. Here you can pick your balance between production speed and starting experience. Experience is actually quite hard to gain, so usually you'll want to go with specialist training. Your troops will fight much more efficiently, which reduces the strain on your manpower, officers and supplies. Quality is usually more desirable than quantity, but there are situations where you might want to pick something else. Economic laws increase your IC and resource income, while reducing your monetary income and consumer goods need. The huge boost to IC and resources makes this easily worth the trade-off, but consider that IC increases much more than your resource income, and your money will also drop, so you'll pretty much be forced to set aside some of that new IC to produce supplies to sell to other countries, so that you can then trade for more resources to support your full industry. Otherwise, you can easily run out of resources with these laws. Educational laws increase your leadership, but reduce your money income. Leadership is very important, so use massive education investment if you can. These laws work the same way as training laws in that there are no requirements and you can pick any of these four laws whenever you like. Industrial laws have varying effects for each law. While the bottom one is as usual the most desirable, it can only be picked when at war with unity above 80, unless you're playing a communist nation. Mixed industry is also decent with its supply throughput increase and consumer product orientation can help you get rid of dissent if you can't quite seem to lessen it just by producing more consumer goods. Finally, we have the press laws. Counter espionage makes it easier for your spies to detect and remove enemy spies that are active in your country. National unity change modifiers aren't necessarily good or bad as the effect both increases and decreases. Changing laws costs a certain amount of money depending on your country's base income. It's not a lot, but it is noticeable, so try to avoid unnecessary law modifications. The cost is displayed next to the law name, 29.7 in this case, and is the same for every law. Whenever a better law becomes available, You'll get a warning telling you that more efficient laws can be enacted and hovering over it will tell you what it is that so you can pick. Next we have occupied countries and occupation policies. I'll switch to Germany in 1940 now, as at that point some nations have already been occupied. When we take over enemy territory, we can assign an occupation policy to it. There are several policies to choose from. Collaboration government would give us 35% of the area's manpower, just 5% of its IC, 30% leadership and 25% resources, while having low partisan support at 1.5. Total exploitation gives us close to zero manpower and leadership, but 60% IC and 75% resources, and there is a lot of partisan support leading to much higher revolt risk in the area. The other options are somewhere in between, and you'll have to choose if you want more resources and IC at the cost of higher revolt risk and less leadership and manpower. There is also a civil war policy, which you can use in civil wars and has no penalties in conquered territory. So over here, we have strategic warfare. 
On the left, we have impact from convoys on national unity. Destroying enemies raiding our convoys will increase national unity, while losing convoys uncontested will decrease it. The number will show you either a positive or negative change to your national unity, depending on how you're doing. Impact from allies increases unity if your allies help you and decreases it if they don't. Impact from bombing is defined by strategic bombers. Intercepting enemy bombers will increase our unity, but if we fail, it will decrease. So finally, we have these three buttons. First, we can mobilize our reserve troops, which should be done about a month or so before going to war to give your troops enough time to reinforce to full strength. Note that mobilizing your troops will increase your threat to other countries which could cause them to attack you or join a faction in an effort to defend themselves. Also, staying mobilized during peacetime costs a lot of consumer goods, which hurts your industry, so try to mobilize only once you're sure you need your forces soon. Then we can liberate a country. Sometimes when a country in a faction gets conquered, it becomes a government in exile and is only fully defeated when its faction falls. If one of your faction mates is a government in exile and you take back his territory, you can liberate them here, which returns their lands to them. The last option is creating a puppet. If you conquer an enemy country, its territory becomes part of your country, unless it's a government in exile. You can then choose whether to keep it as part of your country, or recreate the country as your puppet, which will then act as your ally and give you resources. A puppet also saves you the hassle of dealing with revolts, as you are not occupying the territory. Note that if you start a war with the intention to puppet the target, you should select puppet as your war goal when declaring war. Doing so will allow the puppet to retain its remaining forces. Okay, looks like we got all of this covered, so thank you for watching and see you next time.